Who would like to ask a question, make a comment? Um, yeah, this lady. Yeah. We'll, we'll get you a mic. Are we getting you? Yeah, I think we're getting you a microphone. Uh, this lady over there. And do you want to just say your name? Um, is it on? Yeah. Okay. Uh, my name's Rebecca. Um, I'm from King's. Um, my question was for Dr. Cottom. Um, so I want to know a little bit more about Ella's case. Um, I'm from a working class background. Uh, a lot of the people that I went to school with have ended up in similar situations. Um, and you kind of wonder what you can do to help them. Um, I was quite amazed at the huge turnover of staff that she had had. I want, first of all, to understand why that had happened, if you have, can kind of shed a little bit of light on that. Um, and also tell me a little bit about when she chose her new assistance team, um, who did they comprise of, if that's possible? Okay, uh, let's take a, let's see if there's anyone else. Yep, uh, over here. Hi there, Mark Gollidge, um, I work at the Local Government Association. I'm interested in um, the panel's thoughts around spread and scale of adoption. Um, Anthony had a, um, a slide which was talking about spread and scale, and I know having read Hillary's book, she's got some, a number of comments around spread and scale, because um, we often approach um, wanting to spread and scale pilot programmes around the country, and I'm interested in the panel's thoughts around spread and scale of some of the approaches that they're talking about. Really good question. Um, yep, and there's a question uh, over here. Yep. And we'll take those three and then I'll come back for more. Hi, it was um, a question to What's Anthony. Your name? Sorry. Sorry, it's uh, Andrew Haywood. Hi. Uh, a question to Anthony, which was really about the what do you think stops uh, sympathy groups naturally forming and why, why do we need the, why do they need help? Okay. Um, Hilary, do you want to start with Rebecca's question about uh, Ella's case, uh, and then feel free to talk about um, the issue of, you know, scaling up and all that. Yeah. Do you want to check the mic? Just get the Sorry. microphone. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, I can't make generic comment. You said about your school friends, and definitely one of the things. I mean, Ella's story. I tell. I've been telling, you know, at book festivals up and down the country, and what's really amazed me, or is kind of incredible, is how many people have come up. <laughs> for a book that tells me that they're Ella. I mean, they're not Ella. I mean, I know who Ella is, but, you know, they say that's my story, and I'm thank you for telling the story. And, um, you know, Ella lives in Swindon, which is, like, according... Well, when I met Ella, was the time's best city to kind of raise a family. She lives right next to the Honda car factory, so a politician would say all the opportunities are there. Sorry, Ella. Sure, sure. You know, I mean, like the, the narrative. No, no, it's fine. No offence, take <laughs> um, so, so the kind of challenges are a very, very complex mix of financial poverty with, um, uh, I mean, Ella herself grew up in a situation of abuse. Uh, that abuse has, in a couple of cases, repeated itself with partners she's chosen with her children. She's got very high levels of debt. She's been evicted. She's moved around. I mean, one of the stories I tell in the book is that the first thing we do on the estate, we, we take a house and we move into the estate where she lives to kind of understand what's going on and so that we're there at night and we're there sitting on the sofa when social workers come to call and everything. And one of my first sort of naive ideas is, well, you know, actually, of course, you know, Ella and her family's a tiny percentage of, of people, really, in, in, in the nation. Why don't we ask everybody else in the pub to kind of get involved and what can we do in the community? And, of course, everybody in the pub is like, no, actually, what we want is, like, could you just move that family off our estate, please, because then all our lives would be better. So I think that one of the reasons that um, so many people have been involved in her life is, um, in fact, what, one of the things that happened... Um, is that we actually, because everybody knew her in the kind of fire, police and everything else, is we, we plotted around the wall, we asked everybody to come together and we plotted around the wall when, with everybody, when had the intervention started and, you know, obviously kind of to your point of adolescence, I mean it's kind of a bit patchy when her children are young and then as her children become teenagers, kind of more and more interventions start. When all the workers involved saw everybody's work over 30 years. We went 30 years and then we ran out of wall space. Uh, I tell the story kind of in the book more than I can tell here. People literally broke down and cried because it was like the first time that they could actually see what's going on. 
And if I tell that story to friends of mine who don't work within our welfare systems, they're like, how could that be? But the thing is, it's back to the point I was making, which is it's so stressful. If you're a social worker in a system today, um, basically what you do is you've got this kind of massive list. You've got to manage the list. You've got to manage everybody below a level of risk because, I mean, yeah. you know, we could, I mean, you talked about risk. I mean, risk, in mar risk prevents development. We need a <coughs> developmental welfare state, and actually what we've got is one that manages risk. And I think we need a national conversation about what risk are we prepared to take in order to allow people to grow and develop, but that's something else. So, so basically, it becomes impossible, and you either burn out and you leave, or you kind of numb out and you just keep kind of focused. So when we asked, um, we asked two mothers, actually, to kind of um, to, to, to select a team, and we kind of supported them. And the first person who came in said, so, you know, actually it wasn't Ella, it was another mum called Karen. She says, well, when my son starts to kick off, what are you going to do? And the first guy says, well... You know, I know the rules and regulations, and I'm going to kind of back out carefully, and I'll find it, you know, I've already checked out where the exits are, and then if the noise is still going on, I'll call my supervisor. And kind of this, you're the fucking system, get out of here. And then the next person, who actually happened to be a policeman, said, well... This is just to be clear, this is them interviewing people. Yes, this is them interviewing people. This is your experiment, where they, yeah, where yeah, they no, got to interview the people. We've this in four different yeah. cities, yeah. and it's always the same, because yeah. I'm coming to the, what you want yeah. to know. No, 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 it's which fine. Is that, um, and so the next person, who's a policeman, says, well, I'm going to tackle your son to the ground, and then I'm going to ask you what we should do next. And they go, you're on. And actually, it's been the same everywhere we've gone, that what families are looking for are work? people that won't talk down to them, yeah. who will stick with them, and basically kind of bring their human instincts. Now, um, whenever we go, in four cities we've gone, and we say to people, do you want to work in this new way? We promise everybody who comes one thing, which is that they will spend 80% of their time working with families and only 20% filling out forms. So we'll invert the kind of ratio of what it really means to live in the welfare state. And everywhere, people queue around the block. Because if I train to be a social worker, I do it because I want to change the world, not because I kind of want to fill out forms. So people come forward. And then the other point, which is, is actually, to your point a bit, Anthony, about, um, about uh, uh, sort of... You know, collectives and groups of sympathy. I think the most important thing is, you know, my mantra will be take care of everyone. So everywhere we go as well, we put in really good uh, supervision for the teams doing the work. Because if you're not held and you're not taken care of, you can't be open and do the work. Sadly, everywhere, that is the first thing that gets taken out when we kind of move on. The work stays, but people, you know, because supervision can't be done by anybody in a line management position. It's got to be done by somebody trained to do it, and it looks expensive. But in fact, what we have is very high stability of teams because they're kind of held themselves and they can do the work. Sorry, that was a very... No, it's fine. It was very good. Do you want to say something just very briefly about scaling up? Yeah, so, I mean, you know, as I say in the book, you know, you get... David Cameron head, came to visit you and tried to scale up, didn't he? Yeah, but Ed, let's not make political... I, fail, I <laughs> failed to go and visit Hillary, so exactly. I'm in a worse position yeah, than exactly. David Cameron, so we just to be clear about exactly. that. I think that we, exactly uh, that. We won't... We won't um, yeah. Um, <laughs> no, but I think that more importantly is that it's taken me a very, you know, scale is like the holy grail. People say to you, politicians of all colours come along and go, well, it's very good, but can you scale it up? If they actually and, come and visit. And for ages, now come on, you've been, yeah, but yes, if they come and visit, but anybody who comes to visit. And the thing is, it's taken me a very long time to realise that that is not the way we have to go. So what we can't do, I mean, I love the way that Anthony showed his work. Perhaps it's no coincidence that, you know, the first 15 years of my life were kind of in, similar, in Africa and Latin America. I work in a very similar way. What we can't do is go out and work in people's lives, learn something, and then try and stick it back in a kind of industrial pipeline because it won't work. But we can grow, and we've got very good lessons of kind of organically growing, so taking something, seeding it, supporting people to grow it, and then kind of replicating. So I think that these models can work at mass, and we kind of design them for that, but what they can't be is rolled out like a cookie cutter down the line. Well, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, Andrew asked the question, why don't the groups form naturally? And, and it links, actually, to how you might scale. So the first thing is they do form naturally. So, I mean, if you... In Nepal, you would have funeral groups, you would have farming groups, you would have credit groups, which kind of... Not spontaneous, but they spread very rapidly because there was a need for it. And in the UK, you know, we are all in different groups at different times, whether it's Amdram or sport or... Actually, my, our daughter went away this weekend with, I think, about 12 
girls all from her peer group from school. And they're very much in touch, and that's their peer group. So they do happen. But the question is, do you need to create something a bit new and, uh, or create the ecology within which they can flourish for specific groups who are losing out? So old people in Nepal were actually very integrated into extended families. Grandmas playing a huge role in cutting um, death rates because, you know, there's studies done showing that if the grandma's in the house, that reduces mortality. But they're, in, they're an integral part, and uh, it's a cross-generational extended family. We've lost that through urbanization and modernity. How do we recreate that? And the question is to go to scale. If you create an ecology that works, then things will happen. You create a social edge, then things will start to happen, I would argue, if people really want it. Um, but, but you have now just a final example of a country that, because we've lived in Switzerland for three years. Switzerland's very interesting because it's the most popular government in Europe. And nobody knows who the government is because it's all devolved. They have cantons and they have communes. And at commune level, where we live, which is about 15,000 people, they provide the time, the place, the money to create stuff. So that there's lots of dramatics and meetings of people, and people are engaged. They have four referenda a year. They wouldn't have had any this Brexit nonsense. They would have come back and said, oh, it's an advisory referendum, 52-48. Yeah, we're split. We'll come up with something else and have another referendum in a few months' time and see if we can get it to something that people more want. And that's a very adult way of doing it. And you know, they're out of the European Union, but they have to play a close. Actually, they're in trouble this week because the European Union are ganging up on them. But, but anyway, that's an example of a country that has created an ecology, and it's got the most productive economy in Europe. So it seems to work. And, and that's the scale answer, that you've got to make these groups really fit in with what people want to do. Hello. Just, um, obviously, I'm coming from a very particular perspective of, of working with people who find it extremely difficult to socialise. And so sometime in the, in the kind of setting I described in one of these community rehabilitation settings, what was very interesting is that when we first set that unit up, we used to have a lot of trouble from the neighbours. They were always worried that the people who were living there were going to cause trouble or damage their cars. Or, and whenever there was any trouble, they'd always blame the people there. And what we did was we, we set up a series of, we didn't call them meetings, we called them sort of community invitations, and invited people who lived nearby to come in to the unit to see what it was about. And the whole event was hosted by the people who were living there, patients who were living there. And that completely switched the whole attitude towards the unit. And then what happened is that we started to get the neighbours coming and knocking on the door, telling us that people from our unit were being bullied by people in the, in the neighbourhood. So we turn, you can turn it completely around if you change, if you dispel the myths. And of course, a lot of this kind of nimbyism that you see when, when you're trying to set up mental health units in the community is, is just based on absolute fear and ignorance. I'm interested to ask a question, but I, I, let's take the audience and I might tag mine onto this round. I, I think I saw a couple of hands. Yes. Um, just in the, the fourth row here. I've, uh, I see that obviously what's What's in, your name? Sorry. Oh, my name is Mish Lamarsh. Hi. And that what, hi, what's in common obviously is that there's some need for socialization, that some of the extreme cases are people who obviously have lost their trust of social groups. And in the social edge, um, what it sounds like we're projecting is there is a need for grooming of the imagination of the future, like how to proceed in the future. And that, I think, is what's special about Homo sapiens is um, we have the power of the imagination. And... Um, it sounds like the identification of what the need is for education in the group is very important. And I think what lacks in people who are having trouble uh, or who are um, ignorant it, or, is just that, that ability to identify what it is they need. So some need to learn how to eat, cook. Some need to learn how to, uh, what diabetes is or how to deal with their health. Um, so, I see the power of the group, and 
I think it's interesting to think about the strategy of helping this society, which is urbanized and spread out, um, identify these needs more specifically. Because we're dealing with an education system that has been around for a long time, and things have changed so much. Uh, so I think the education that young adults need is not there. For example, how to eat, what is nutrition, how do our bodies work? It's all very scientific and removed and not as practical. And I think some of the practicality that, that we used to get from uh, our, our families, from our larger social groups and the smaller villages are now missing. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, and a uh, second row here in the red. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Yeah. Hi, my name's Nisha Shah. Um, I'm really interested in this idea of um, what's happened since the institution of the welfare state as our societies become increasingly individualized. We've sort of yeah. adopted this massively individual culture which ends up dividing us up into groups that are unnatural. And I do wonder whether Professor Costello's work has been so astonishing, actually. I really, I'd really like to speak to you about something else later, if that's possible. Because it's like you're pushing on an open door. Here we are in the whitest group I think I've sat in, in a work setting, in a very, very long time, at UCL in the middle of London, where, you know, where are our minority groups who can tell us about extended family groups that are more functional, about 15 in size, I reckon. You know, when you get down to the nuclear family with mum, dad and two kids, you fight. We know that. We know that it's we not need... not just my family, then. Oh, God, and mine. We need more... You know, I've always thought you need extended family to raise children. You know, that auntie is there when you're having a massive fight with your mum. You know, I just, I've, every, every single one of you who've spoken have sort of spoken to something that feels to me to be something that we did once upon a time know, and we've been working really hard to forget it since setting the welfare state up. Okay, that's good. Uh, yeah, uh, and then over here, and we, I promise you we'll have time for another round, we've got till 7.15, so. Um, hello, uh, my name's Fiona, I work in UCL's widening participation department. Um, I wondered if the panel had any thoughts about the rhetoric around who is deserving of um, support from the welfare state. That's good. Um, because I think often uh, the people who need the support the most are in a kind of double bind where they, like John in the story, maybe don't really know how to interact with the system and how to communicate what they need and how to access this kind of support. Um, but then people who are struggling with things like mental health or addiction or have been through the prison system also then face the stigma of not being seen as deserving support. And I wondered if the panel I'll, I'll get you to react to that. Can I just add in another question? Hillary and I have discussed this over a number of years. Um, uh, I think this question of scaling up is really, really interesting. And I, and I suppose my observation would be that while it's true that you can't just say cookie cutter, we're going to just reproduce this everywhere, in general, and it's not true everywhere at all, the state is not good at thinking in this way. In other words, it's, it's I'm going to deliver the medication to you or the service to you. I'm not going to think who are the other people with this condition in these circumstances who I can link you up with. And I, and I, and I think one of the interesting puzzles, so I've got a friend who's... Um, uh, um, son is on the spectrum and you know he's had absolute battles with his local council about this and I've often talked to him about this about you know a state that was thinking about how do you empower people would say do you want to know the other people who are in similar circumstances now why doesn't the state do that one resources and the state's been massively cut back and I think we shouldn't ignore that and you know you you are very cognizant of that in your work but secondly I think the state is fearful of sort of empowering people against it uh, because they think you know oh my god is this going to lead to massive overload and so on but but I think I think while you can't sort of impose it in a cookie cutter way surely the, the state could be more facilitative of this yeah. who, who wants to who wants to well who wants just to on that yeah I'll uh, uh, re react to these questions as well, as well as mine. The institution of the welfare state, the issue of deserving and undeserving, the issue of education and its role. Well, any, the, any, 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 look, I'm a medic, 
and I was brought up, health is what you do to people. You know, that's what you give them antibiotics, yeah. you do this, doctors know best, yeah. and we're highest in the hierarchy, and yeah. then there's the, you know, and we've got, and it's still there. And it's all about what we do to people rather than letting go and yeah. deprofessionalizing and, and empowering people to take control of their lives. And, and when we're thinking about non-communicable diseases, you're not going to solve obesity by telling people what to do. It just doesn't work. And, and you've got to have a systems approach. But within that, and it's back to the hard to hear groups or the hard to reach groups, um, it's or because the undeserving. The I mean, undeserving. About deserving and undeserving, and that that. <laughs> In the yeah, I mean, that's nonsense. I mean, the other thing I'm very cautious about is saying, you know, a certain person called David Cameron had big society. As a, but you can't, I don't, I'm not arguing that sympathy groups will substitute for the decisions that need to be taken at a higher level around proper benefit systems, living wages, the appalling UN report that we've just had out, 14 million people in relative poverty, 1.5 million in destitution and that very good Australian New Zealand guy who spoke about it hardly covered on the BBC and laughed at by our government yeah. I was absolutely appalled by that and we see it every you know walking to work now you clambering over people in in shop fronts and that's appalling now you know getting homeless people together might play a role in terms of, but you've got to have a, sure. a state structure that solves some of those problems <laughs> But there was somebody talking, oh, the imagination of, you know, this touches on, um, what's his name? Who wrote Bowling Alone? Robert, Robert Putnam. Yeah. And Benedict Anderson always talked about imagined communities that, you know, we, we've moved from the village to our imagined communities and you've somehow got to restore that. I don't think it's quite as bad as we think because I see a lot of, uh, activity going on below the radar in in the UK and the like. I mean, one interesting talking to some people, and I don't know a lot about this, but the Grenfell, you know, with Grenfell it was a disaster of governance where the richest borough in, in the country did not invest in social housing, wanted people to go away, tarted them up to make them look nice, but they were a fire. The whole thing a disaster. And afterwards, a lot of anger, a lot of uh, people trying to help them but being turned away. Most of it has come from the community where they've formed their own groups, they've started to mobilise, they've asked questions, it's got hostile at times. But I think that was very interesting to look at. But um, anyway, I'll let others. Well, I think it's, that's interesting historically because one of the reasons that Beveridge's third report failed was that he was running around looking for kind of Victorian societies and everybody else was going, well, it's different now. There. It's football, it's the pools, it's the cinema. And he refused to recognise those new forms of yeah. collaboration and therefore wasn't able to build on them. And the same might be happening now. So I think the question about you know, whether people know what they need or want is a very complicated one. I work with a Amartya I don't work with a Amartya Sen, I work with a Amartya Sen's uh, capability framework, The Economist. And, you know, that started, Amartya Sen grew up in Bengal in the famine and he wanted to know why do people starve who are so close to food. In famines there is always food close by, why do people starve? Which is an interesting metaphor, I think, for our whole society. And the other thing that interested him is that if you go and work in famine camps, which I've also done, is that you, the person who's got the lowest identified needs is always the oldest woman who is there who will say, I'm fine. So I actually think that people, everybody I work absolutely does know what they need and what things are if they're given the chance to express it. In fact, the problem I find is the other one, which is that you have to work slowly. I mean, it very much goes to your work, I think, Helen, about kind of not sort of getting in there in the beginning, but having, being there for the kind of long term so that people build the confidence because a lot of that is unpicking what you are told you need or deserve by society and how you need to unpick that, which is also why I work with the capability framework, because I think we need to unpick the kind of external and internal realities of people's worlds, which is not like go away and get happy, but actually these things are quite profound. So I think I find everywhere I go people know, but often time and support is needed to kind of raise that up, if you like, because people perhaps would actually settle for too little, is what I'm saying, sort of the reverse. Um, 
And then, I, yeah, maybe I'm just, I, I said I'm, I'm tired and tetchy, but perhaps I'm going to get tetchy now because I feel the same about this thing about, you know, what we used to know about, about being in groups because when I, you know, my personal experience of that is that those extended family networks are basically about women doing kind of unpaid work of care and frankly, I'm not interested in being in any of that and I feel so blessed every day that I am not my grandmother, I can't tell you. So I'm really not interested in that. I'm interested in how we kind of form multiple different yeah. forms of group in multiple different ways. And because I think, you know, that, that, that you know, change has to be collaborative, and in fact change can only be sustained in collaboratives or, you know, whatever we want to call it. When I work, my unit of analysis is always the group. So if I meet you, I'll say, can I work with you, but can you immediately bring a friend? And I leave it completely open. You can bring a friend, you can bring a family member, and from there we'll grow, but we'll never start with one person. So, like, it's good if we've got that kind of emotional memory of being in groups. <coughs> that, I'm a bit more worried about kind of going back to extended families. And then sort of, kind of, you know, that's also, I don't know, there's a sort of theme really with the kind of them and us. And I think it is really interesting. So one of the things that I've been reflecting on after kind of six months of talking about uh, radical help is how quickly conversations can become, even kind of in rooms like this, about some kind of imagined, it is an imagined community of people who might need help versus us in this room who might be talking about. And it's so weird because the thing is, all of us need help. Yeah. And surely demographic change, you know, more than anything is showing us that all of us are going to need support. And, um, and it's one of the reasons that some of the models like, it's one of the reasons, for instance, my employment work can't grow, is because the employment work I've done succeeds because it's not a jobs club, that I'm facilitating communities that have everybody in it, but that doesn't fit any DWP category for which I can get money, because I've got to go and find somebody um, who's deserving. But can I go now to your point of, of so... Um, I think that this work can definitely grow, and I think I would like you to go and visit Wigan, where this work has really grown out of a kind of small experience, actually of the family work, and then taking those um, values and then hiring from kind of, you know, whether it's the HR person or the accountant according to those values. But what's really interesting in Wigan is they have this thing called the deal, and the deal is a new vision, an agreement between... Um, you know, those who work within government locally and those who are in the community. But when I, I mean, I've been to Wigan quite a lot recently, and what really strikes me kind of in community, you know, cafes and primary schools and everything is that people talk about the deal, but what they tell you about is stuff they're doing in their everyday life. They don't tell you that I'm doing this better service. It's, it's somehow this deal, this vision has got everybody in Wigan to be the best version of themselves. And that's kind of what we're missing. And and the state amazing leadership has facilitated that in Wigan, of the leader and the chief executive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it couldn't have happened without the state, but it has gone so beyond any idea of service delivery, and it's so powerful. Okay. So it's alive, That's and kicking. That's <laughs> um, well, I wanted to come back to this thing about who's deserving and who's not. You know, when the, the example I gave is someone who I, probably everyone would agree is deserving, in that, you know, someone with extremely complicated problems for many years. But I suppose the point is, it probably reflects something you just said, Hilary, is that we're really talking about what people used to call social inclusion. It's a bit outdated as a term now. But social inclusion is dynamic. So you might, you might have a lot of things stacked against you early in life that put you in a category that makes you more likely to be socially excluded. And then things can come along, like education, for example, meeting someone who you know, inspires you. Something happens which pushes you into a more included space. Then you get ill and you're more excluded, etc. So I think that, for, for me, that the, the, the welfare state is about being able to support people at times when they need it. And for a very small group, it will be for a very long time. It may not be forever. I mean, the recovery orientation that I was talking about that uh, the rehabilitation services adopt and a lot of mental health services adopt in this country is all aimed at thinking about the individual, how can we make them the best person they can be? How can we get them involved in society in the way that they want to be? And that's the difficult thing, is because when you, when you come from any kind of model, you have a, a template that you're thinking, and you have to turn that around and try and really listen to what the person truly wants. And, of course, that's very challenging when they kind of don't know and can't communicate that to you. Well, just to be making a little bit optimistic, I'll come to another round. I was at um, uh, Finsbury Park on Saturday morning. Uh, for, it was my first park run. 
Does everyone know what Park Run is? You know, 438 people, you know, at Finsbury Park on a Saturday morning at 9 a.m. Why it's 9 a.m., I don't know. But anyway, leave that to one side. Uh, um, uh, it would be better at, like, 10. But, but, um, uh, but, but, I mean, I think it's extraordinary, and I think it is, but I think it goes to your point. I, I, I mean, I don't want to make this sort of reductive to every community thing that happens, but, you know, everybody needs this. This isn't just about, you know, certain people. Uh, let's take another. Let's take another round. Oh my goodness! Now everyone wants to speak. Yes. Thank you. My name is Alicia, and I am a student here at UCL. I have two questions. I promise I'll be quick. One for Professor Killaspie. Um You spoke about uh, the individual, the patient, um, from the point of view of the caregiver. Uh, at any point during his care. Was he actually focused on, and could you talk a bit more about that? And what I mean is, was he given a chance to talk about how he was feeling throughout the whole process? Okay. Did he have any kind of understanding of how he got to be there? And okay, that's a good that question. Kind of thing. And, um, and the other question, actually, Professor Costello touched on it. I'm really glad you spoke about the homeless problem, because that's something that, that it really stood out to me. I'm new to London, and in coming... Uh, to London, the first thing that I noticed was that there were so many homeless people, but yet yeah. the city is so prosperous. So could actually yourself and Dr. Cottam talk a bit about how your work might be able to help homeless communities and how anybody in this room might be able to participate in that? Okay, good question. And then along the row, I think this gentleman uh, had a question. My name is Simon O'Hagan. I declare an interest in being a friend of Anthony's. Right. Um, it's been a fascinating session. Thank you very much to everybody. I'd like to ask Anthony about loneliness, um, which strikes me as a function of more developed societies and how we might tackle that as opposed to the kind of work that Anthony's been doing in the le less developed world. And does the future lie in communal living in some form or other? Okay, a really good question. Uh, yep, there's a question right at the back. Sorry, I'm making you run around. Uh, but right at the back in the white shirt. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, how would you deal with people being stubborn? Uh, so this is to Professor... Um, Costello. Oh, sorry, was it Costello? Yeah. Um, how, because people, if they accept that they need to go to a sympathy group, then they're also accepting that they need help. So I think maybe that's one of the problems why people don't go to um, as many sympathy groups as they should. So how Good do you question. propose we should deal with that? Come and join my sympathy group. It's uh, uh, a good question. Oh, my goodness. I'm, I'm going to take another couple, actually, so we can get more people in yeah, in the front row. Thank you. My name is Nikki. I work Hi. for the NHS. <laughs> um, I'm interested in the whole um, question of compassion and how compassion can be developed in our communities to maybe solve some of these problems and issues that are discussed today. Okay, compassion. Uh, yep, and then there's two people in the middle there. Yep, the two of you, yep. I, I, I'm keeping sort of broad track of these questions, don't worry. Don't worry, don't worry. Um, hi, I'm John. Um, I just What's your name, sorry? My name's John. Hi. I'm just an innocent bystander. Um, so about um, a lot of the things being raised so far, um, we mentioned kind of like looking to the future and adapting how that might work. Um, we kind of looked at um, the study, there was one study of, um, that was talking about um, the, um, using mobiles as a con and kind of dissemination via that as a control group alongside another control group alongside this kind of community um, work. And then also we talked a bit about scalability and also um, isolation and the problems with you know, facilities being way out of town and how far it goes. So I just kind of wondered how, how you guys um, envisage the role of um, tech and its use in kind of actually bringing Good question. people together actually is, is possible, uh, viable in your lines of work. Good tech, yes. I have a question for Professor Costello, but it might be relevant for all three. Why don't you call him Anthony, by the way, all oh, this sorry, professor Anthony. stuff, you know. Um, uh, I'm a professor. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> This 
discussion is about, is, uh, about equality between groups. So, uh, about equality between groups. Uh, so, I work on research with refugees in East Africa, and everyone's completely dependent on their small social networks and groups. But some groups are much wealthier than others. Some groups yeah. have members that are much more supportive than yep. others. And as a result, some have much more stable lives than others. How do you overcome that type of inequality if you're dependent on groups? Okay, let's try, let's try with that group of questions. I mean, if we've got time, we'll try and do um, uh, at the end. Uh, Helen, t t take your pick slightly. <laughs> uh, but, 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 but there was a specific question from Alicia about how the, the person you were talking about was feeling, whether he was talking about his feelings uh, throughout that process. Um, and then there's a whole range of other questions on uh, loneliness, on why would anyone want to be part of a sympathy group, um, on compassion, uh, on tech, and on um, equality between groups. Okay, so with that particular example, um, of course we were trying to understand what might help and what he wanted. And the difficulty of when someone is very psychotic is that they are effectively in a different reality to everyone else around them. So it can be very difficult to work out what, what his uh, desires and wishes are. And of course, in this particular example, he was finding it very difficult to communicate at all. He was mute a lot of the time. But I suppose this overlaps with a broader question that has been raised, which is about compassion. And when you work in these sorts of settings and you're working with people who are so unwell, the key to anything changing is compassion. So you, you engage in a compassionate way. You, you are listening very carefully for all the signs, verbal and non-verbal, of communication about what might be going on for that person. And, of course, you're trying in some ways to, to sort of second guess and interpret those. And sometimes you get it right and sometimes you don't get it right. I think it's, it's an irony, really, that in psychiatry we are the doctors who literally have the most power. We often don't feel that way, but we literally have the power to lock you up to take away your autonomy. And of course, you have to use that power very, very carefully. And it's, the irony is that despite having that kind of power, we try to work in the most collaborative way we possibly can. We try to really flatten that hierarchy that Anthony mentioned. We're trying to flatten it within the whole team who are working, but actually much more importantly with the person we're working with. And you can't always do that from what I described. Of course, you could hear the number of times this gentleman ended up detained against his will in hospital, the number of times we had to force him to take medication. That doesn't sound very collaborative, and it probably doesn't sound very compassionate. Actually, it was done because of compassion. It was done around trying to just make the situation safe. Let's see if we can get things more stable. Let's see if we can get this person into a position again where they can actually begin to, to know a bit more about what they want in their reality, and we can then work with that. And I think that's, that's, a, I mean, that's the task of mental health practitioners all the time, is, is walking that balance, that tense balance between supporting someone and promoting their autonomy. And sometimes, at points, you have to take more responsibility, and at other times, you're trying to give them responsibility. And often it feels a bit like, my analogy for this, it's a bit like parenting teenagers. So you're basically trying to shove them out of the house, but also you're trying to make sure that they're safe. And you have to kind of, you know, constantly walk a line that's quite uncomfortable and you make mistakes along the way and then you kind of have to reel things back in again and set some different boundaries. And it's a bit like that. But it is done very much with a, with a compassionate heart. Okay, thank you. Hilary? Yeah, I, I thought Helen's story was so powerful. I mean, like, I wonder how many people so I'm not I'm meant to ask the question, I'm asking, but how many people get the vision of being with somebody like John for 10 years and actually, because how many people who cared for him do you think actually know what happened in the end? Well, this is, this is part of the, the systemic problem, is yes. that, you know, systems like the, the, the one I showed where people come in and out of units and there's a kind of, there's a, there's a pathway, but actually it's only me who's known him that long. He will have had lots of workers um, across all of those different interfaces in the system who've had to get to know him from scratch. And of course, sometimes that's a massive benefit because some people haven't seen him very unwell yes. and they don't feel any kind of bias or fear of how he can be when he's extremely unwell. That's really interesting. 
Yeah, that's really interesting. Because also we know that there are studies that show the stress if you're not able to kind of stick with people and support people for a long time. But um, because I think, you know, sort of it kind of relates to the point about sympathy groups, which is, you know, one of the things that I say is that we need to kind of, when we do think within services, we need to think of them like relationships. And actually what happens is that you're supposed to kind of pile in first and if you don't kind of respond then somehow you're forgotten and people move to the next person in the queue but if we thought about every interaction like a relationship we wouldn't say go and join a sympathy group we would kind of build a relation slowly and I think that that's what happens in our work is that we kind of reel people in quite slowly but we also understand for instance that um, you know we had this um, support for older people called circle and we invented a category called helper because men would never join as members, they would only ever join as helpers. There's no difference to the helpers and the members, but a man would only join officially to help other people because it would be too sort of mortifying to say that you need... So, I mean, I think kind of how the language, it goes with the compassion, how we kind of think about labelling these things is really important. I wanted to say something about digital, because one of the things that I write about in Radical Health is it's not just that the problems have changed, but the resources have too. So one thing is that as many of us were educated, we really want to participate if systems are designed to allow us to do it. And the other is that digital systems enable that to happen in yeah. a way that can be supported over time. And whereas perhaps once you had to rely on this kind of particularly charismatic person to support the group, you don't need that anymore. You can kind of use digital platforms to kind of keep things going. And I think that that's certainly all the work I've done would not have been possible in a kind of pre-digital world. It might have existed in a sort of 70s incarnation or even a 30s incarnation that I've drawn on and learnt from, but it couldn't exist in the way that I'm designing now. And can I just say one thing, which I just feel a bit sort of goes to some of the questions, which is I do think as well that there is a kind of problem of category error, and perhaps it goes a bit to the homeless question, which is that perhaps this is your problem, Ed, not... David Cameron's problem, but perhaps this started more with, with your gang, which is that um, <laughs> which is that we have not grappled with the kind of structure of the economy that causes these problems, and we have pushed them into the welfare state. And so we can talk about all these yeah. things, but if we don't restructure exactly. the economy, we can't solve them in the kind of welfare bag. And I, I do think that's really important. I mean, last week somebody came up to me and said in their local authority, they're just going to have a strategy for loneliness. Isn't that marvellous? And I really kind of didn't know what to say. I felt something inside me died because I thought, really? Like, what about a kind of good local economy? What about, you know, I think we need to kind of ask much bigger questions as well as kind of working with people who obviously are kind of feeling lonely. Sorry. Um Simon talked about loneliness being a sort of developed country problem. Actually, some of the loneliest people I've met are young women in, in very poor countries. Because if you, imagine you're 17, you get arranged marriage, you move into your husband's family, they treat you like a slave, you get pregnant, you're terrified. I mean, I personally think the way groups work is most of all about reducing stress. Women would walk in Nepal for two hours across mountains to get to their group once a month because it was such a break from the drudgery of their lives and they felt they could relate with their peers. They were desperate for it. So it's, it, it's not simple, actually, all of this. I think all loneliness manifests itself in different ways in different societies. Simon and I are in a sympathy group. It's a book group which uses both monthly meetings combined with uh, online systems to abuse one another after football matches. Um, but he went on to say, should we be moving to communal living? Simon, I don't want to live with you, <laughs> without any question. Um, we've talked about compassion mobiles. There is, there is a lot of um, room for this interaction. I think we need to look at it about how, I don't think, I think mobiles are brilliant for all kinds of things and for management and information and systems, but I don't think they're so good for changing behaviour and they don't provide necessarily the support, but they can complement, you know, in different ways. Finally, there was a, a good question about equality between groups and also within groups, and we looked at this. So, for example, we were interested, are we just getting the kind of the even in very poor communities, the middle class ones. And we weren't actually, we ex act when we analyzed it in Nepal, you found, and in India, that the very uh, educated, of which there weren't very many, but the tertiary educated women didn't come to the groups. And there were a few very marginalized groups, like forest dwellers and things who wouldn't come. But otherwise, 
both uh, across the board there was parity with non-attendees of, of social class. And, uh, and, and actually the caste issue was dealt with in that there was cross-caste talking. Men are more difficult. I think the issue of men coming into groups, you know, I talked about men's sheds, but there may be other issues there. There's always a concern that a group will become a power centre which excludes others. And that's a risk of a group, and you need to look for that. I'm not saying it never happened, but we, generally speaking, women are good at this, that they bring in others and, and they're supportive. And the biggest power of our groups was that even when we only had 30% of newly pregnant women, I thought, how could we have this impact? And the reason is that the group members then decided to go off and visit the, the isolated prima gravida women who are 17 in their homes and give them a lot of support throughout. And when there was a crisis, there were people to turn to rather than just dying. And I start the book actually with stories of maternal mortality that make you, you know, cry because it's so sad to see that this was unnecessary without a little bit of social cohesion. Let's just have one or two final questions. We're slightly about to go over time. So, yeah, we'll take these two and then we'll, we'll finish. Yeah. Over here and then over there. I'm sorry to, not to get everybody in, but yeah. Thank you. Uh, Afzal Siddiqui. So this is just uh, in response to a previous comment about um, how, do, uh, this, how does the state facilitate communities or networks? And this is maybe not directly relevant, but this comes from the energy sector. So uh, in the latest clean energy package of the European Union, there is a electricity directive and article 16 refers to local energy communities which says that member states shall ensure that local communities can be f formed or owned and so on so this sounds just like some legalese but actually it has led to one of the largest clean providers of energy in germany that was formed yeah. by a community in the black forest they didn't like the service that they were getting from the private sector they bought it out, they set up their own uh, network, and now they're able to sell into other communities. So this is one tangible way that perhaps could be transferred to other sectors of the okay, economy. Okay, that's, that's great. And then over here? Hi, um, my name's Emily. I work for a charity in Northwest London um, with young people who self-harm have been through sexual abuse. And we've been running this peer group for 15 years now. And we've just had an evaluation completed that showed that um, our peer mentoring and the way that we've run our group has something like 88% um, recovery rates from self-harm, stopping wow. self-harming. Um, and we've, I mean, we've known this for years because we've been running the group and we see what it does. Um, but this is the first piece of research that really, really cements what we do. And... My question is from, from my perspective, I'm a student here, but I also work as a support worker for the charity, is I've known this stuff about groups and about um, how the impact this has on people's lives, very literally in the issues that I work with. And the young people ask me, they go through and they say, what can we do? Like, how can we... They want to change things. They want to make things better for other people. They want to help others. And... I struggle to know what to say to them because listening to all this, it's, it's okay stuff, yep, yeah, okay, this all makes sense. But then it always comes back to, okay, so we need this infrastructure to exist to support and um, help these groups exist because the struggle that we have is that we have no funding. We don't get any funding from the government. We have limited funding from um, some big charities like Comet Relief, Children in Need. But we struggle constantly to actually have the things that we need in place to, to provide this group. Things like supervision, like you were saying, it's so, so necessary when you're working with these young people because it's a really, really hard job. What's your job. group called, if I may ask? Um, so my charity is called The Wish Centre, um, based in Northwest London, and we run, yeah, we have run therapy in this peer support group. Um, Sounds like a good candidate for the Global Challenges Project here at UCL, I would say. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'm up for it. Um, meet, you should meet Ian afterwards because yes. he's, got, he's got pots of money. So, uh. Great. <laughs> my pockets are empty. Um, but yeah, so my, my question really is, is we know what we need, how, so how do we get it? As one person who interacts with other Great people, question. what do I say? How do I say, right, we need this, this stuff to happen, we need this money, we need this structure to be created. Great how question. is it going to happen? 
I mean, that, that, that is a really good, uh, that really good uh, question. Thank you for sharing your experience. Um, because actually, sort of it was what I was going to end on, which is, you know, in a way, part of what we're talking about is relationships and sort of, I don't like the term social action, but sort of, you know, in some sense, in, so, in some sense that. Um, uh, what, um, uh, it wasn't a selfie, was it? No. Uh, what, what, um, what, what, you know, what, what can people do, is, is my question. It's sort of the question when we've talked before, I've asked. So, but let's go down the road. Helen, just any final thoughts? Feel free to react to um, what you heard. Um, I know more about the Electricity Directive, Article 16, than I did before this meeting. Or <laughs> uh, um, uh, the very good question asked about you know, what can people do and, and you know, how can we actually make this happen? I, I do think there is, there is power in people coming together and making a case for... I think one of the, the things that, that is very disincentivizing to that is, you know, running out of money, running on a shoestring, and this is what's happened, you know, working in health, work, working in social care. Hilary described it really well. People just get very burnt out and start just doing the day job because that's all they can do. And I actually think sometimes you need to sort of step back and think, what can we do at a strategic level with other organizations that are a bit like us, lobbying, getting relatives of people you've helped to lobby their local MP, but not just the MPs. It's, it's a bigger thing than that. We, need, do, we do need to raise a bit more of a social conscience in order to really push back the fact that what we're, a lot of what we're talking about is a very fragmented system which is very much <coughs> under-resourced, or the example I gave, actually not necessarily that much under-resourced, just the money's being spent in the wrong place. Really good. Hilary. Well, I just want to say, what a fantastic audience. I'm still thinking yeah. of all the questions you asked before, and I'm kind of like thinking of, it's just been brilliant. I think yeah. this room could sort the world out. And I'm really, thank you for asking. It's so great that the final question has been from somebody yeah. doing something. Totally. It's completely fantastic. And I suppose that, I guess I'm a bit like you, which is that I've written a book, and you can buy it or not, but, and you'll think, perhaps, this is great. But the daily reality was that, over the last 10 years, I've spent 96% of my time looking for money, and I've spent 4% of my time doing any work. And now everybody goes, oh, that's great work. But the personal cost, actually, has been really, really immense. So I kind of don't have any money. I'm looking for money again for my next thing. And so like, I'm a useless person in that sense. But just to say kind of on a solidarity level, I kind of hear you. And I think that this is why, really, I'm inspired by beverage, that when we had the welfare state, you know, we... We'd had a war, we'd had the kind of huge recession, we could have just thought it was just dreadful, it was dreadful, but, you know, leaders got together and they said, I mean, it was a long process, but essentially this is the framework, if you are in this framework with these principles and these values, you will get money, and so, for instance, doctors had to join the NHS, they didn't want to, they kind of came kicking, screaming and complaining many of your predecessors, but they had to. And so that's why I think that, you know, I wanted to kind of articulate the need for a new framework that would value the kind of things you're doing and kind of direct resource. I mean, when I say the margins, I don't mean because what you're doing is marginal, but because compared to what's happening in the kind of core system where the funds and the resources are locked, it is marginal, and that's what we need to do. And Ed, we're looking to you. <laughs> we believe in you. <laughs> Just on this final point again, um, obviously you can campaign so that the political climate changes to do, and that's a long-term thing. Secondly, you can raise money, and all of us struggle to raise money all the time, whether we're doing research or charities or programs, and that is a big fight, but you can keep doing it. Final thing is that, I mean, with your groups, the question would be, can you empower them to run themselves? I, I was very struck in Nepal, after the earthquake in May to uh, April 2015, um, I went back to Nepal about three weeks later, and we had pulled the plug on our groups, 200 of them in Makwampur district in about 2011, I think, so four years before. And I asked the team there who were doing other things, what's going on, and we could go and find out. And they went round and they, they managed to identify in that north part of the district 110 groups that were working the same groups coming together again and new people joining that on their community <coughs> response to the earthquake because the government response was virtually non-existent. So, it, you know, I think as your self-harming, very high-risk group mature and develop and enjoy it, maybe I'd be interested to know, firstly, your results, because that sounds fascinating. I hope that's going to get published. And, and secondly, you know, what, what they're doing to self-sustain, if you like, 
Yeah, yeah, come back. So, so I was actually a member of the group at age 14 when oh, it right. started. I was one of the first members. Oh, so you, yeah, interesting. And I went through the whole process of everything, then I came back, and now I work with them. So it's the, a massive part of what we do is it's almost like training, you know, it's not training, but we, we train each other, we train the young people how to mentor each other, that's the entire point of the group, it's not about, I'm a therapist, it's, we're training you to, yeah. to support each other, and for me that came full circle, and it's something that we always try and perpetuate in the groups that we run, is who's going to do this next, who's going to do my job next, like, you know, it's an, it's an ongoing thing, and it's really, really, really powerful, because people come to our charity, they get the support, and they stay, and they stay, and they, and they work with us for, for years. I've been involved with the charity now for 12 years. 12 years. So that is a massive, massive thing. Really, really important. Thank you. Well, look, um, you, I think Hillary's <laughs> completely right. You've been an absolutely brilliant audience. Um, uh, and you're going to be signing... We're all going for a drink. I but you're, yeah, I'm not, right. Are you not signing your books? We will at the same time. But with a drink in our hands. Well, you're Ian, you're going to tell us voice. where that is, are you? Yeah, so um, three votes of thanks. So firstly, for our wonderful panel. Thank you, Chair.